Perfect? Bang on my chest if you think I'm perfect. Go ahead, bang on it. No heart? You gotta have heart. Miles and miles of heart. This is Patchwork Heart Ministries Young Catholics Respond, brought to you by Breadbox Media. Now, here's your host, Bill Snyder. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the program. I am Bill Snyder, and today my guest is Tony Agnesi. He is a inspirational storyteller, author, and blogger. His uh, Sunday blog and Wednesday podcast have an international audience. In 2015, Tony was a finalist in the 15th annual Weblog Awards, uh, the Bloggies. His blog ranked in the top three internationally in the religion and spirituality category, and he is a member of the Radio and Television Hall of Fame. Tony is a member of the Catholic Writers Guild and is a frequent contributor to Shalom Tidings magazine. He is a frequent guest on Catholic Radio. Uh, Tony and Diane, his wife of 44 years, lives in Wadsworth, Ohio, and they have two adult sons, a beautiful daughter-in-law, two grandsons, Nico and Luca, and they love their lives. So, uh, Tony, welcome to the program, and thank you so much for joining me today on Young Catholics Respond. Bill, it's a pleasure being with you. I'm a fan of uh, Patchwork Heart, and it's just uh, exciting to spend some time with you and your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Tony, uh, you you are so accomplished. Uh, tell me just a little bit about how you got started in you know writing and, and doing all of your ministry. Well, it's kind of an interesting story because uh, I, I am uh, not the brightest uh, guy. I, you know, one of those C-minus students. Uh, voted most likely to be shot in a drive-by in high school, so I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not the 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 genius type of uh, type of guy. And my first uh, assignment in college, my first writing assignment, came back to me, and it was an F. And the professor said, "You'll never write above a sixth grade level," and it kind of really uh, stilted me. And I've always been a storyteller. I come from a family of storytellers. My grandmother was a storyteller. My mom was a storyteller. And I've had a long, wonderful broadcast career by being able to share stories. You know, someone else was a storyteller as well. Jesus shared stories through the parables. And the neat thing about parables is uh, because the story is memorable, we also remember uh, the lesson in, uh, in the parable. So uh, I didn't do any writing. I just told stories. And over the years, people said, uh, you know, Tony, you've got to write some of these things down. You've got to write some of these <laughs> things down. So. In 2012, I started writing some, uh, some of these stories. There are 700-word stories, 750-word stories. Everyone is attached to Scripture, and then they all have some uh, some uh, ideas at the end for some things you can reflect on. And I had written about a half a dozen of them. I gave them to a college professor friend of mine and said, could you read these over? And she said, sure. Retired professor. She read them over, and I said, what do you think? And she's, oh, they're wonderful stories, Tony. And I said, well, more importantly, what level do you think I write at? And she said, about the seventh grade level. <laughs> so in 40 years, I'm up a grade, Bill. <laughs> Amen. That's awesome. Since, since then, I've written about 270 stories, the first 72 of which are in my book, uh, a Storyteller's Guide to a Grace-Filled Life. And uh, in that book, we talk about family and we talk about the virtues. We talk about how grace comes to us at the holidays. Um, and uh, the second book is, there's 68 stories in my second book. And the reason I'm mentioning it is it was just uh, finalized last night. And uh, with a little proofreading, it will be published August 1st. And it's the book that kind of I, I would like to spend some time talking about because it relates to Patchwork Heart as well. But the book is entitled A Storyteller's Guide to Joyful Service, Turning Your Misery into Ministry. And what I found over the years, Bill, is that when people take their problem, their their affliction, their their uh, a situation that is causing them the most misery, the Lord has a way of taking that and turning it into ministry. Now, you've done that with certainly with the with the heart surgeries and so forth, and what you managed to to pull together in your ministry. The the parents of a, of an autistic child tend to be the par the people raising money for autism, huh? The guy giving. Um, a homeless man, a pair of boots on the bridge, was homeless once himself. The family who brings food uh, at the holidays to a family who may, maybe can't afford uh, a, a Christmas meal. 
Uh, they had someone bring food to them at one time. And so that's how the Lord uses us. He, he uses us and he uses our misery to, to turn those things into a, a, a way of service. And my book talks about joyful service, and we get a great deal of joy out of serving others by taking what, you know, been there, done that, and turning it into a ministry to help others. It is so true, and uh, it's at the core, as you mentioned, of, of Patchwork Heart Ministry, Tony. But uh, I, I want to kind of ask you, because the book is uh, going to be uh, super neat, uh, I think, for a lot of people out there, a lot of young people as well. Um, but I want to ask you, what's your favorite story uh, from the book, if you don't mind giving us a little tease? You know, not a full spoiler, but, <laughs> but just a little oh, tease wow. of it. Well, my favorite stories, uh, and, and it, I, it's kind of two stories that I have to weave together, and uh, uh, the the outcome of both of the stories is both a lesson and a cure. Uh, uh, years ago, about 14 years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer, and um, you know that's a that's a tough situation. You go, you have a colonoscopy when you reach the age of 50, and a lot of younger guys ought to do it sooner, but um, you, you know the doctor said uh, the doctor's office called and says, "Can you come and talk to the doctor when now and bring your wife?" Well, you know that's not good news, and so uh, I was diagnosed with colon cancer, and all of the anxiety and all of those things that well up in your mind uh, as I drive home. When I got home that day, Bill, there was a, an email, and the email was entitled Seven Prayer or uh, the Seven Great Prayers." And uh, it said, I'm going to send you one of these prayers every day. I did not know the guy who who sent them, but uh, uh, I uh, read the first prayer. And the first prayer was, thank you, God, for dot, dot, dot. And I uh, sat down and I prayed, thank you, God, for an early diagnosis. Thank you, God, for a doctor who is going to be there for me, for a beautiful medical staff. Thank you for a wife who will support me through all of this. And 90 minutes later, Bill, I was still saying thank yous. Wow. And when I, quit, when I quit that prayer of thanks to God, I never worried about the cancer diagnosis again. And, um, uh, you know, after surgery and all of that, uh, I have been cancer-free now for, for 13 years. Uh, one of the things that came as a result of that was a year later, I was diagnosed with hepatitis C. Now, that's a, a disease that uh, they that comes from uh, uh, bad needle use uh, for, from drug addicts and so forth. It comes from uh, bad transfusions that may have taken place years ago and so forth. Uh, we didn't know where mine came from. It could have been something I had carried around for years, a lot of my generation uh, have have uh, been diagnosed with hep C, but at any point I had it. And uh, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to go to one of the best hep C doctors in America up uh, in Cleveland. And um, my particular gene type is the one that reacts the worst to the drugs and, and therapy, which was a interferon kind of a chemotherapy. And I asked the doctor what he thought I should do, and he said, let's wait. There's some drugs on the horizon, some things that might help. Um, a couple of years ago, if you remember the TV commercials for Harvoni, yeah. and when Harvoni came out, I was a perfect candidate for Harvoni. As a matter of fact, in my gene type, it had about a 99-point-something cure rate. And I was a candidate for it. So we applied through my insurance company for Harvoni, and it was turned down. And we applied a second time, and it was immediately turned down again. And then the doctor's office helped me uh, to do some additional testing. We did all sorts of questionnaires and testing. We resubmitted it a third time, and again, it was turned down. And one of the uh, one of the uh, women that worked for the doctor, she was so... Uh, uh, dead set that we were going to make this happen. And we did some other things and she applied one more time. And on uh, January 2nd of 2015, I received word from the insurance company that, that uh, I was approved for Harvoni. Now Harvoni bill cost $93,000. It's a pill a day for uh, uh, 12 weeks. Uh, so your 90 pills are $1,100 a piece and they would cover 80%. So I was on the hook for $18,000. And my wife and I were prepared that we may have to spend that amount of money out of pocket. And 
Um, the doctor's office called again. The persistent woman in the doctor's office said, I want you to call this woman at the at the manufacturer of the drug. And I did. And they had a, um, a, a, a thing going on where if I would allow them to use all of my information, not my name, but all of my reports and so forth, they would pay everything except $38. <laughs> and I wrote that check very, very quickly, Bill, for $38. <laughs> and then I started on Harvoni. Um, about four weeks into Harvoni, we did a blood test and the hepatitis C appeared to be gone after uh, the 12 weeks. It was gone. And the doctor said, we wait three months. This would put it to June and we'll do additional blood work. And if it's still gone, we consider you cured. And uh, I remember going to the doctor's office. Uh, it was about an hour drive to get there. And I sat in the little uh, room, uh, the little exam room, waiting for him to come in and uh, and was essentially just praying the rosary and waiting. And he walked in. Guy doesn't have much of a bedside manner. And he leaned up against the counter and he said, Tony, you're a busy guy and I'm a busy guy. You're cured. And he left. <laughs> and I sat there in tears. And uh, for the hour I drove from the doctor's office to my office, um, I cried all the way. I thank God all the way. I repeated those thank you, God, for prayers. And as I got off uh, the exit to go to my office, there's a, a drugstore straight ahead, and I saw a man who appeared to be homeless. He was sitting on the sidewalk, slumped down. Uh, leaned up against the wall of the drugstore, and there was a there was this nudge from our Lord to go talk with him, and so I pulled off the road and wiped my tears and went up to the man and said, uh, "Is are you okay?" And he said, "No, I'm not." And I said, "What's what's wrong?" He says, "I have a prescription that needs to be filled, and I don't have the money to do it, and I have no one who will loan me the money. I've tried to beg for my the money and." And I can't get the money. And I said, uh, do you have the prescription with you? He said, yes, I do. And he handed it to me and I said, come on. And I helped him to his feet and I walked him into the drugstore bill and I paid for his prescription. And his prescription was $38, <laughs> the exact amount that I had paid for $93,000 worth of medicine. Now, here I was, because I had insurance, because I had a job, because I had a, the, the, one of the best hep C doctors in America, because I had his office working on behalf, my behalf, I was able to be cured. And then here's a homeless man whose life was in jeopardy because he couldn't get his heart meds that were 38 bucks. And I don't think it was a coincidence that it was the exact amount that I paid. <laughs> no. And from that point, and from that point on, I began working with the homeless, and uh, have uh, dedicated a, a great amount of time to working with homeless folks. Yeah, Tony, that's an incredible story, and uh, you are an amazing storyteller. I can't wait to hear more on the other side of the break. It's amazing how fast time flies when uh, you're listening to great uh, stories like you're able to tell. Um, so, have to take a short break. We'll uh, hear more from Tony Agnesi on the other side of it. Uh, I am Bill Snyder. This is Young Catholics Respond. Right back after this. Our Blessed Mother wants only the best for her children and has given us a special place where she promises to help all those who appeal to her motherly love and protection. Telling Saint Juan Diego that here I will alleviate the sufferings of all those who love me and seek my protection. That holy place is now the site of the beautiful Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. If you would like to learn more about how you can visit this special place of grace, please visit vivaguadalupe.org for more information. Our Lady may be calling you now. The Contemplative Stations of the Cross audio devotional is now available from Patchwork Heart Ministry. This devotional features an introduction and overview of the theology, history, and spirituality of the Stations of the Cross by Father Bill Zimmer, a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago, along with an audio version of the Contemplative Stations of the Cross led by author Bill Snyder and the Stabat Mater, chanted in Latin by Marissa Ellison. CDs are $7.99 and digital downloads are only $3.99. Copies may be purchased by visiting patchworkheart.org or calling 
424-704-3278. That's 424-704-3278. Hi everybody, Bill Snyder here. Just want to thank you for listening to this episode of Young Catholics Respond. And as a founder of Patchwork Heart Ministry, we have so much more going on than just our podcasts. Check it out at patchworkheart.org. Do you want to keep your finger on the pulse of Patchwork Heart Ministry? Follow our monthly blog, Written on Our Hearts. Simply go to patchworkheartministry.blogspot.com and click subscribe and follow the on-screen instructions. That's patchworkheartministry.blogspot.com, then click subscribe. Your heart is always beating, but you never have to think about it. Welcome back to Young Catholics Respond. Once again, Bill Snyder. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of Young Catholics Respond. I'm Bill Snyder. Today, my guest is Tony Agnesi. He is a very inspirational storyteller, author, blogger, podcast host, uh, and he's just telling us um, really about his life and about how the Lord has, has used him as an instrument uh, and also uh, healed him and just done some amazing things in his life. Um, and right before the break, uh, we were talking about Tony's uh, health and diagnosis of you know cancer and then uh, being healed of hepatitis C. And, uh, and really how that has moved him into uh, ministry. And um, he left us off talking about homelessness. So I want you to kind of pick up there, Tony, and, and talk about uh, your ministry and moving into um, be, you know, uh, homeless ministry. Well, I, I, it's, been, it's been a wonderful blessing. And I, I'll share one story with you. It's kind of a fun story. Um, it, it, I go to Mass every day in the morning. And when I can't go in the morning, I go to a downtown church in the downtown Akron area in Akron, Ohio. And they have a Mass at 1210, which is kind of cool because I can get in my car at noon. And literally every red light will turn green until I get there for the 1210 Mass. And it's a rather large church and over a thousand seats. And I walk into the church one day and there's somebody in my seat. Now, you know, I'm one of those guys that I have my seat at church and, uh, you know, a thousand seats. Why are you sitting in mine? You know, <laughs> and it was a, it was a young woman. I thought maybe a college student in there praying that her exam went well that day. But as I got closer, I went into the row that I would normally be at. And, and I realized that she was a homeless woman, young, probably in her late twenties, early thirties. And I knew she wasn't Catholic because when Mass started, she was kind of fumbling and didn't know what to do. I shared my hymnal with her and told her to sit still when I went to communion. And when I got back from uh, communion, uh, uh, we sat and we smiled. And at the end of Mass, as I was getting up to leave, she stopped me and she said, can I share something with you? And I go, well, of course you can. And she said, I'm homeless and I have a fine to pay at the courthouse, which is right next door to the church. And she said, I don't have the money to pay it. It was $50. And you see that woman down there, that elderly woman in the front row? Uh, when I, I, all I had was a ticket to, uh, to, on the bus, and I took the bus downtown, and I walked from the bus station to the courthouse, and I saw this church. I hadn't been in a church much before. I was in church a, a few times when I was a little kid, but never since. And so I walked in to pray for a miracle. And that young, that elderly woman saw me crying and praying, and she came to me and asked what was up. And she said, I owe a fine of $50 to the courts next door, and I don't have the money. And the elderly woman pulled out her checkbook and wrote a check for $50. And she held up the check so proud to show me her miracle. And the elderly woman's name started with Judge. Uh, she was a judge in the court, uh, retired. And I said, that is fantastic. You got a miracle. That's so wonderful. And as I got up to leave, she stopped me again. And she said, Tony, I haven't eaten in three days. I was wondering if you could help me. And I, it was one of those days, Bill, that I didn't, uh, have, uh, uh, any money on me. You know, my wife gave me a $20 allowance that month, that week, and I had blown through it. And <laughs> I knew that there was a, the university had a, uh, a, a little, um, cafeteria nearby and they had an ATM machine and I said come walk with me and we walked down the hill to the uh, to the university's cafeteria and the ATM machine just happened to be my bank and 
So I went and I got her enough money for to eat and enough money for the day. And uh, and it was coming to the time that she had to report to the courthouse. And so I walked her back up the hill. And as we got to the top of the hill, uh, she looked at me and she threw her arms around me and gave me the biggest hug. And she said, you know, I walked into a church for the first time today, hoping for a miracle. And she said, I never thought I would get two. And uh, she walked away to the courthouse. And uh, I've seen her at mass a number of times since then. That was several years ago. And uh, she is at mass uh, during the week, often at daily mass at 1210. Isn't that a great, great story of how the Lord works in people's lives? And just the thought of, you know, I'm going to walk into this church and pray for a miracle for someone who is unchurched. Uh, is just our Lord at his best. Uh, yeah, and, you know, I think there's so much need out there in the world. I think, you know, young people um, will try everything except for uh, Jesus. You know, I think I think there's a uh, aversion to that for whatever reason. And when, when somebody has faith like this woman, uh, just to say, you know what, I'm totally lost. I need a miracle. Uh, God, if you're out there. And so if you're listening to this and you're listening to uh, Tony tell these stories um, and and you're feeling like that, you know, um, do one small, simple step of faith. You know, you might not believe you might not. You might be struggling to believe whatever, whatever it is, um, you know, take one small step toward that. Crack the door this much and God can step in and use people in in their ministry, right? I mean, that's just it. He he uses he uses us um, to be his to be his miracle workers, um, mm-hmm. and and so that's just an amazing um, amazing reminder uh, for all of us, uh, and and those of you out there who might be struggling and uh, trying to find your way, uh, just take one small step in the uh, the right direction, and God will open up the doors. You, you bet. There's a, a piece of art. It's a famous uh, piece of art that shows Jesus at a doorway and he's standing at the door and uh, waiting. And uh, you can tell he's been there a while because the weeds are high and uh, and uh, the uh, painting is beautiful. But one thing you notice when you look at the painting is there's no doorknob on Jesus' side of the door. And the and the thing that it's saying is, if you want Jesus, you have to at least open the door, that one little small act that will crack the door. And if you do, he'll come in. And Jesus is carrying a lantern in his hand. And as you walk down the path, he's lighting your way. But we have to initiate that. You know, just like the prodigal son, when the prodigal son returned home, the father ran out to greet him. That's what Jesus does. When we make that small step that you talked about, Bill, that one little step of faith toward the Lord, he will rush to us uh, to help us. And uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a lesson we all need to learn. You know, the statistics, Barna's study recently said 51% of millennials, people under the age of 30, when asked what their orig- religious affiliation is, say none. And for someone like me, I find that just to be so disheartening because the Lord has blessed me in so many ways, a cure for cancer, a cure for hepatitis C, pneumonia as a kid that I almost died, the the things that he has blessed me with by simply reaching out and say, Lord, I can't deal with this on my own. Please, you know, please help me. And he does. There's a little prayer I, I, I say every morning, uh, Bill, when I receive the Eucharist. And uh, this is a prayer that you should never pray unless you mean it. <laughs> and the prayer is this. Lord, make me an instrument. Put somebody in front of me today that you can help through me. And I'm just going to put up my antenna, Lord, and you put somebody in my path today that you can help through me and I'll do it. And let me tell you something, Bill. It happens almost every day. The Lord will put somebody in your path that just the just a smile, just a spoken word, just a shoulder to, to lean on, just anything. And and it has been such a blessing. And the joy of doing that, the grace that flows to you from helping others uh, is remarkable. And uh, 
you know, the other the other little prayer that uh, that uh, uh, was sent to me was, uh, God, show me a sign that you exist, and He will show you signs all the time. Why did that homeless man's prescription cost $38 when my $93,000 prescription cost $38? Why did that happen? Is that a coincidence? Or is that the Lord giving me a nudge, right. you know, saying, yes, I'm here. You just need to call on me. Exactly. And, uh, Tony, I know that uh, you also do a little bit of uh, jail ministry as well, and you and you moved into that. You know, we we only got a few minutes left, but you know, I want to just talk a little bit about the blessings of of being with those uh, who are in prison. You know, it's it's amazing. I do job in my thirteenth year of jail ministry, Bill, and and uh, I go go in on Tuesday nights. They lock me in, and I'm there for four or five hours. And, and uh, uh, a, a church uh, a few weeks ago uh, bought uh, fifty copies of my book to sign for inmates. And I walked into a, a, a county jail and sat down and, and autographed books for, for inmates there. And, you know, what I'm finding is a great deal of the people that are in jail right now, not necessarily in prison, but in jail, are there on, on drug charges. And the drug charges are heroin charges. We have a tremendous heroin epidemic. And here in Ohio is kind of the epicenter of it. And uh, these are not what you would think of as a heroin addict. These are just normal guys and girls, most of them in their 20s and 30s, who for whatever reason, uh, you know, maybe they were a heavy equipment operator and hurt their back and were uh, prescribed Oxycontin. And when the script ran out, they, they needed help and turned to heroin. But whatever reason, um, I go in there not to judge uh, how they've gone through their problem, but to, but to be in awe of what they've gone through. And and to be able to share my books with them has been a, a real blessing, and I really appreciate the church that did that. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. Uh, I, I want to make sure we uh, let listeners know again about the book because uh, it, it, it is right at the heart of our ministry for sure. Uh, the title of the book is uh, A Storyteller's Guide to Joyful Service, Turning Your Misery into Ministry, uh, which is certainly what you've done with, um, with all of your stories in your life, Tony. Uh, but I also want to let you, uh, you know, promote a little bit about the website, your, you know, speaking and all that stuff, because you have a wonderful ministry. Yes, indeed. If they go to my website, it's TonyAgnesi.com, T-O-N-Y-A-G-N-E-S-I, like Agnes with an I on the end, dot com. Or they can go to FindingGodsGrace.com, or they can go to a storytellersguide.com. It'll all take you to the same place. But every week I write a 750-word reflection, and um, uh, it's, oh, they're always tied to Scripture. They always have some things to think about. And every Thursday, I'm, I'm on hiatus right now, but every Thursday we do a, what we call a snackable podcast. It's a podcast that you can listen to in under five minutes. And it's a story with a point to be made and, uh, and, and asking you to kind of reflect on. Uh, those are uh, delivered uh, by email. So if you want to subscribe, you can go right to them and subscribe and start to receive them. Um, and I do a thing called Daily Grace where I uh, just uh, write about those things that uh, I come in contact with uh, on a daily basis. My first book is for sale there. It's uh, A Storyteller's Guide to a Grace-Filled Life. Uh, if you want God's grace to envelop you there's an infinite amount of it all you got to do is ask for it and and uh in the book we talk about how we get that grace from family and friends and from living the virtues and so forth um a lot of stuff to see and do on the website and uh and uh, i'd love to have you have you check it out spend some time there tonyagnesi.com is the address tony thank you so much for being with me today uh, i wish we had more time in the episode but we'll have you back uh to tell more stories and to share uh more faith with us uh, i appreciate your time uh bill thank you so much and god bless and uh, your ministry at patchwork heart i will be uh your your ministry will be in my prayers as well and uh just been a real pleasure being with you and, and sharing with your audience i know it's a younger audience than me but I share Jesus with anyone I can, I can share Jesus with. Amen, amen. Well, thanks again, Tony. This has been an episode of Young Catholics Respond. Until next time, from all of us here at Patchwork Heart Ministry, keep beating to your Catholic heart. This has been an episode of Young Catholics Respond. For more information about our program or to be a guest, visit patchworkheart.org, email info at patchworkheart.org, or call 424 704 3278. 
That's 424-704-3278.